are not going to get the training the people who enter confined spaces get because you do not need it. You are, I don't think any of you really want to go into permit required confined spaces. Leave that to Can you define school. the difference between a permit required? We will. That's what space. we're going to watch a video, and you're, that's, you're even going to get to take a quiz. Oxygen deficiency is the atmosphere having less than normal percentage of 
oxygen found in normal air. Oxygen is safe when it is between 19.5% and 23.5%. When the level of oxygen falls to 16%, judgment and coordination suffer and difficulty breathing and drowsiness occur. At 12%, a person becomes unconscious and death occurs at 6%. The level of oxygen can fall if the space contains iron, which uses oxygen to form rust, methane, which pushes oxygen out of an area, and carbon dioxide, <coughs> which absorbs oxygen. Never enter a confined space unless the oxygen in that space is sufficient. If entrance into an oxygen deficient space is required, wear a supplied air respirator to provide fresh air. Confined spaces may often contain gases, vapors, mists, or dusts that are flammable. The risks of a fire may not be obvious, and only testing can show if it contains traces of flammable substances. Substances in the air can be ignited by smoking, grinding or welding, unapproved electrical equipment, or any kind of metal friction. Inhalation of the atmosphere can be toxic. If a substance exceeds its permissible exposure limit, it could cause illness or death. Inhaling just a little of some substances can cause irritation to the respiratory or nervous system. Such toxins include carbon monoxide, which replaces the oxygen in the blood and can cause death. Hydrogen sulfide can cut off breathing. It can be easily detected by its rotten egg smell. And sulfur dioxide is very poisonous, even in small amounts. Dizziness, drowsiness, nausea, or headaches are good signs that the confined space should be evacuated immediately. Another hazard a confined space may have is the potential for engulfment. This happens when an employee is trapped, buried, or smothered by liquid or flowing solids, such as grain or sand. Even if the material doesn't cover the head, the pressure on the chest can be enough to prevent breathing or damage internal organs. Some confined spaces have an entrapping design. Employees can be trapped or asphyxiated by inwardly converging walls or by a floor which slopes downward and tapers to a smaller cross-section. Confined spaces may also contain physical hazards, such as moving machinery parts, buildup of heat, falls from entry or exit ladders, noise from machinery, and electrocution from live wires. Employee training is a very important part of safety in confined spaces. It is up to each employer to maintain a safe working environment. Each employer's permit required confined space safety program must ensure that all authorized entrants know the hazards of the confined space they are about to enter, use proper equipment, communicate with the attendant as necessary, and alert them whenever a potential dangerous situation or <coughs> condition arises, and exit from the permit space as quickly as possible when required. OSHA requires employers to provide training before assigning duties to employees pertaining to permit spaces, before changing employees' duties, when the procedures change for the permit space, or when it is evident that an employee needs additional training. Authorized entrance, attendants, and entry supervisors should fully understand the signs, symptoms, and the resulting dangers of hazards in the confined space. Procedures for entry into permit spaces. How to communicate with each other during occupancy of permit space, as well as rescue procedures. And how to be safe in a confined space. OSHA requires a written entry permit program be developed and implemented by the company before entering a permit required confined space. The program should be available for inspection by employees and their authorized representatives. Employers must implement necessary measures to prevent unauthorized entry, identify and evaluate hazards of the permit space, develop and implement procedures and practices necessary for safe 
permit space entry operations, including, but not limited to, specifying acceptable entry conditions. Provide opportunity to observe any monitoring or testing of permit spaces to authorize entrance. Isolate the permit space. Eliminate or control atmospheric hazards. Provide barriers as necessary to protect entrance from external hazards. And verify that conditions in the permit space are acceptable for entry throughout the duration of an authorized entry. Employers must provide and maintain all equipment for safe entry into and rescue from permit spaces. All employees must be trained in the proper use of all the following equipment. Testing and monitoring equipment needed to comply with the OSHA standard. Ventilating equipment to obtain acceptable entry conditions. Communications equipment. PPE. Lighting equipment to see well enough to work safely and to exit the space quickly in the event of an emergency. Equipment needed to enter and exit space. Rescue and emergency equipment. And any other equipment needed for safe entry into and rescue from permit spaces. Additionally, employers should test the conditions in the permit space to determine if acceptable entry conditions exist before entry is authorized to begin. Test or monitor the permit space as necessary to determine if acceptable entry conditions are being maintained during the course of operations. When testing for atmospheric hazards, test first for oxygen, then combustible gases and vapors, followed by toxic gases and vapors. Employers must provide authorized entrants the opportunity to observe the pre-entry and subsequent testing or monitoring of permit spaces. Employers must also re-evaluate the permit space in presence of any authorized entrant who requests re-evaluation. This is done because the entrant has reason to believe that the evaluation of that space may not have been adequate. Employers should immediately provide each authorized entrant with the results of any testing conducted in accordance to the OSHA standard. Employers need to provide at least one attendant outside the permit space into which entry is authorized for the duration of the entry operations. If attendant is monitoring more than one space, employers must include in the permit the means and procedures to enable the attendant to respond to an emergency affecting one or more of the monitored spaces. The company needs to designate persons who have active roles in entry operations. The duties for each of these employees must be identified and training must be provided. They must also develop and implement procedures for summoning rescue and emergency services. The employer must develop and implement systems for the preparation, issuance, and use and cancellation of entry permits. Review entry operations when the employer has reason to believe that the measures taken under the permit space program may not protect employees. Revise the program to correct deficiencies found to exist before subsequent entries are authorized. And finally, permits must be kept on file and used to review the program within one year of the permit entry and revise the program as necessary to ensure that employees participating in entry operations are protected from permit space hazards. Employers may perform a single annual review covering all entries performed during a 12-month period. Employers must post an entry permit at the entrance of a permit required confined space. It is important for the authorized entrant, attendant, and entry supervisor to read the permit before working in or around the space. The permit must contain the space to be entered and the purpose. Permit date and length of time the permit is valid. The name of the authorized entrant. The personnel serving as attendant and entry supervisor. The hazards of the permit space. The methods used to isolate, eliminate, or control the hazards of the permit space. The acceptable entry conditions. Results of initial and periodic tests performed. The rescue services that can be contacted and the means for contacting these services. The methods to maintain communication between the authorized entrant and the attendant. Equipment needed to perform the tasks such as PPE, testing equipment, communication equipment, or rescue gear. Any other information.
information that is necessary for the circumstances of the confined space and any additional permits required to perform work in the space, such as welding. Authorized entrants should know the hazards that are present in the workspace, properly use equipment, communicate with the attendant in case of exposure to a hazard, alert the attendant when any warning signs of a dangerous situation or prohibited conditions are recognized, Exit from the permit space when the attendant orders an evacuation of the confined space. Any warning signs of a hazard are recognized. A prohibited condition is discovered. And the evacuation alarm is activated. OSHA requires the employer to train all attendants that will be watching over a confined space. Employers should ensure attendants Know the hazards of the confined space and the behavioral effects of those hazards. Know how many authorized entrants are in a confined space and be able to identify each one. Never leave the entrance of the confined space while authorized entrants are inside. Monitor and maintain communication with the entrance about the hazards that could be presented inside and outside the space. Contact rescue services as soon as they determine that the authorized entrant needs assistance with escaping. Warn unauthorized persons to stay clear from the confined space and advise authorized entrants and entry supervisor if an unauthorized person has entered the permit space. Be able to perform non-entry rescues and do not perform any additional duties that could interfere with the primary duty to monitor and protect the authorized entrant or entrants. There must be an entry supervisor for each permit required confined space. The entry supervisor can monitor more than one space at a time. The duties of an entry supervisor include knowing the hazards of the confined space, including the mode, symptoms, and consequences of each hazard. Verifying that proper entries have been made, as well as all the proper tests have been performed, and that all procedures and equipment required are in place and ready to use. Terminating the entry and canceling the permit. Removing unauthorized individuals who enter or attempt to enter the restricted space. And determining that entry operations remain consistent with terms of the entry permit and that the acceptable entry conditions are maintained. Employee safety is a major concern during confined space entry. Emergency rescue teams must be available while authorized entrants are in the confined space. The rescue service is to close off the area, get authorized entrants out of the space, and perform first aid when needed. Deaths often occur during rescue situations. Many times, employees attempt to rescue an entrant without the proper training and then get caught themselves in the confined space. It is best to use a retrieval system outside the space to bring the employee out of the space. Authorized entrants should wear harnesses connected to the retrieval line. The retrieval equipment must be in place before employees enter the permit space. One of the most important components of PPE in a confined space is a respirator. I'm going to stop here. We've talked about the PPE. I got a, a short quiz. Yeah. All right. Question quiz. I'm going to go over. Yeah. Now, none of you are authorized entrants. Talked about you've got to have confined spaces marked, permit required confined space. What's the wonderful issue that's related to municipalities. Who knows? They're not governed by OSHA. They're not governed by OSHA. So they don't have to have a sign up to say permit required confined space. Well, that's horseshit. That's the way, that's why, one of the reasons I said we got to do the training because you got to have an understanding and there was, and I'm kicking myself, I saw somewhere where there was multiple deaths due to H2S exposure, but I think it was in another country somewhere, and a, there was a leak. Several here. Yeah, but I mean like a double-digit body count oh, in the last year or two somewhere. It came up when I was doing a search on something. I was like, oh, but I didn't have access to a printer at the time, and I've been 
gone for a couple of weeks and not necessarily thinking of work. Um, so when you're going in, most of what you're going to go into is non-permit required confined spaces. The, probably the biggest thing people need to realize is if you are uh, in a situation where somebody collapses, this always sounds harsh, not, don't, you don't rescue them, okay? They talked about two-thirds of the fatalities are rescuers. Okay, so they had, and I always remember this when I was either right before I got out of school or right as I got out of school, and uh, it happened up in Wisconsin at a dairy farm. They had a manure pit. You get methane. Grandpa, for some reason, went down the pit and collapsed. His son came along, saw that. It's his dad. So he jumps down to rescue him. He probably hollered out to his son. Because the son came along and saw grandpa and dad down there. Can't leave him down there. I'm sure he thought I could jump down, throw him on my shoulder, climb out. So all three of them ended up dying. Because the reality is if you jump down into a pit, what happens when you land? You exhale. It's kind of one of those, you can't hold your breath, drop down 10 feet and not think you're going to. And as soon as you inhale, you no longer have oxygen. You can't. You, you just can't do it. Uh, I used to tell people, you know, as first aid responders, you know, if somebody's bleeding and you don't have barrier protection, let them bleed. And people would look at me. I'm like, you don't want their blood on you. I said, but is there a barrier here if we don't have gloves? I see a trash can. That trash bag's a good barrier. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do as a barrier, and you can direct them to put the pressure on themselves. Uh, we had in Florida here just a couple years ago, people were complaining about an odor from the sewers. So the sewer guy, for some reason, decided to go down without checking the oxygen levels, checking anything. He collapsed. His buddy went down after him, but he called the fire department first. And then the fire department, for some reason, one of the firemen were dumber than most because he couldn't get down with his tank on his back, so he went down without a tank. And he collapsed, too. Um, he ended up surviving. They pulled him back out. I think they had a, some retrieval equipment on him. But when two people collapse, you know, or one, you don't go in. So self-preservation is kind of important. It sounds cold, but I would one death's unacceptable. Two or three is ridiculous, you know. So but what we're dealing with is you're dealing with a little bit of H2S. It's kind of nasty stuff. These monitors are good for 24 months. Literally, all, it, the clock is ticking once you turn them on for 24 months. You press the on button, it cycles, it's on, and the clock is ticking. So I don't really want to pull them out. Clip it on up here, on your heart. Figure out what works for you. If this thing starts beeping while you're somewhere, get the hell out. And I don't mean you hesitate, because it's probably never going to beep. But if it does, Go upwind, not downwind, too, if it's a depending on the environment. You're probably going to be indoors if it ever happens, but turn and get the hell out of there because if this ever, be I doubt it'll probably ever happen, but if it does, that should be like an oh shit moment to you. You know? And what level does it be? This is a 10. And what happens at 10? Uh, huh? There's a lot of to your body. Oh, no. Is there any symptoms when it beeps, or is it going to catch it before we get dizzy? Or ten, ten is a level. It's going to. It's going to. You stay there and then continue to get, get exposed. You're going to have problems. Yeah. yeah. So it's one of those. It, it's set low enough. Turn and get out. You know, because the problem is, ten parts per million is not a lot. You know, so if it's beeping, and you go in, it beeps, and somebody else tells you it's okay. Thank well, you. Think about this. We do lift station odor control yeah. systems, yeah. and they're designed to scrub 200 ppm. Yes. I was in a room that was being scrubbed by for 200. That leads me to my question. At the 
plants at Casey and Bell especially. Mm -hmm. Their buildings have confined space, signage all over the building. Mm -hmm. There's no entry. But is it permit required? Does it say permit required? Uh, what, is there a difference in the signage? Yeah. Yeah. Some places will only put signs on permit required. Some will put mark anything confined space. It depends on the companies. Uh, you are required to mark permit required confined spaces. Someone like KCP and L, I bet you even their non permit required confined spaces are marked because they're a little anal just about. Marked as confined space, but not permit required. Right. Okay. If it just says confined space, if nothing else, you should go. Oh, need to pay a little more attention. Yeah. Just it should make you think. They've got signs on those smaller buildings out there. Yeah, because not, hey, that bathroom, not meant for continuous occupancy. Can we have bad air in that bathroom? It's a small enclosed space. You're not supposed to, you know, that I, I make light of that, but. Well, on Friday mornings with this group, you damn right. You better wear your monitor. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, this is going to give you time to get out. If it is a, I don't know that with your exposure if you could ever have an outdoor one but you'll see places where at refineries they have the wind socks because they need to know which way to go you don't run you don't run downwind because you're not getting out of it you run upwind uh, we're you guys are probably going to be more indoors as a norm but just something to keep in mind you always go upwind if you're outdoors if you're indoors you get the hell out uh, you talked about you jumping, you exhale. You can stop taking a turn and, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I, not going to say run, but walk with a hell of a purpose and get yourself removed until this thing stops beeping. And are you usually with people from your client or are you by yourself? Both. I figure the majority you're with somebody, but occasionally yeah. you're going to be by usually yourself. Client. Yeah. Do they have monitors? Do they even think about it? If it's confined space, most, most municipalities do. Yeah, the bigger ones do. They actually, some of them will follow OSHA even though it's not required. Right. But it's just too much of a liability. Today. Right. And you get to the smaller places, though, smaller cities, they don't have the resources. I know the safety manager for Casey Mup. They don't have to follow OSHA. Let me tell you, their guidelines look like they follow OSHA. Okay? Uh, because think of the exposures to their employees. Think the same thing. They don't want anyone dying. So all we're doing is awareness training. I want you to understand what requires a permit required confined space because you should never go into permit required confined space. You don't have the training. Okay? Uh, we're talking we go three or four hours of the training. Would you say Chuck's a little attentive about entering confined spaces? Yeah. <laughs> Our written program for confined space is the longest written program that we have. It's easily 60 pages long. It's about this thick. It is mind-numbing. And then there's about 10 pages of forms. And when we do the training, tell them, what you do is you follow the you check, you go step by step. It is slow. It is painful. I've had people complain, oh, this is a pain in the ass. I said, so is dying. I said, because if you do it all the time, it's a little bit easier. For me, the fear is people who don't do it all the time because then they think it's awkward and slow. Well, yeah, because we want to make sure you come back out. This is one of the few things that can kill you. So, so two things. So on your barrier comment, so with Ty shaven, he nicks himself, it's close to his jugular, he's bleeding. We should go get a trash bag and put it over his head. <laughs> no, you don't have to necessarily go over his head. We've got a quiz. I was just getting ready to say it depends on how much you like Ty. And then, and then number two, so I was on a job 20 years ago at JCI, and we were in a hole, the lift station. We hit pigs in the lines, and mm -hmm. we had both pigs blue. Wow. Dropped 2,000 gallons of raw shit on top of a guy. We had him out of there in 10 seconds, but it was still, it was still Scary as hell. not a good situation. Yeah. Um, there was diesel fuel uh, that a guy upstream in the system was at a repair facility. So the lines where we picked mm -hmm. were slick. 
And so the pigs, even though we had them aired, they once they had enough water behind them, they just blew out. Like rockets. They, they blew out like rockets. Boom, boom. And uh, so that was uh, that was back when I ran field service, and uh, and then I got to go down the hole. Yeah, it's not fun. Let's do the quiz, and then we will go over the answers.